Hello everybody, my name is Vince Smith. I'm a senior informatics researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. Before we start, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and also to apologize for not being with you in person. Circumstances beyond my control mean that at last minute I was unable to travel to Greece. Nevertheless, given the topic of my talk, it's perhaps fitting that I'm giving this presentation digitally. Technology is transforming not only how we work, but also what we do. And in this much shortened version of my presentation that I was planning to give, I want to highlight some aspects of this digital transformation. So my talk title is Delivering Biodiversity Knowledge in the Information Age. But before we get onto this in detail, I thought it might be worth saying a few words on my background. Having done this, I want to say a few words about some of the digital tools that we've been building to tackle these problems faced by many different research communities working on taxonomy, taxonomy and systematics. Specifically, I want to highlight the scratch pads, which are a platform for communities to help manage biodiversity data. The new biodiversity data journal, which is a journal that's linked to the scratch pads and allows communities to get credit through a publication for managing this and structuring their data. And then finally, the eMonocot project, which is an example of how communities working in different scratch cat pads can bring together their data across different taxonomic disciplines. So from these tools, I want to move on to looking at some of the big informatics challenges within the biodiversity science community. And these broadly group under three themes covering social issues, such as how we make our data more open and accessible, data issues relating to how we more effectively mobilize the legacy of existing data that we have within our community, and finally, give some examples of synthetic issues uh, to do with how we bring all of our data together. Finally then, I just want to close by summarizing some of the opportunities for addressing these challenges, particularly through the European Union under the new Horizon 2020 funding framework. So first off then, some background. I want to, and I want to start by saying about how I moved from being a taxonomist and a systematist to someone interested in building digital infrastructures. So my career in science started by working on these things. These are parasitic lice. And what most people think of when they think about lice is the human head louse like this specimen featured here. However, there are in fact about 5,000 species of lice and about 12,000 different associations between lice and the mammals and the birds on which they live. So out of potentially about 15,000 host species. And these parasites are really interesting because they're highly host specific. Particular species of lice live on particular species of mammals and bird. But when I started working on this group, we really didn't know very much about the systematics of them at all. There were no keys, very poor taxonomy, and, the, uh, and uh, just a single phylogeny of, of the group. So as a consequence, I started to build, uh, compile various sources of information about this group electronically with colleagues. And we started to build various web-based tools where we could collectively compile all sorts of information about lice. These were tools like LouseBase, which was a little tool for managing louse collections so we could share our specimens more effectively, a lab notebook for recording our primers and our DNA sequences, literature and image management tools, even a host parasite checklist for managing all those thousands of associations between the lice and the mammals and the birds. And my reason for doing all of this was that so that the research community that I was working in could be more efficient, more collaborative, and frankly, more productive in our research on lice. These digital systems made our louse research quicker and easier. They also improved the quality of this work because of the comprehensive nature of these online databases that were continually being edited by a community of specialists working on this group. And in many ways, my research on lice is like a microcosm of research in other areas of biodiversity science. We each work in our research communities on various topics, perhaps like some of these listed here. 
topics like applied ecology, conservation science, genomics and evolutionary biology, these are at the heart of what we do. So my goal switched from being someone who basically just worked on lice and providing some digital tools about working on lice to building digital infrastructures that were specialized in trying to generalize those tools to other research communities so they could get the same kinds of benefits. So in effect, my research is really about trying to join up all these different research areas and research activities through digital infrastructures. And then ultimately, the ambition is to use this as a tool to address big questions about biodiversity science relevant to science and society. So issues like species conservation, the impact of human development on biodiversity, human health, climate change, uh, effects of alien species, all these are critically dependent upon research across many different areas. And it's only by bringing this work together that we can really start to address these, these areas. So my research took some early steps toward uh, trying to tackle this problem some years ago through the development of a variety of software tools. And in this section of my talk, I just want to very briefly highlight three examples of these kinds of tools, which I think are helping to bring about the kind of integration that we need across the biodiversity science community. So the first of these tools is something called the scratch pads. One of the big problems within our community is the challenge associated with managing and curating the data that we generate. We build up rich lists of taxonomies, literature, images, checklists, identification keys, phylogenies. The list is almost endless. But there's no simple tool for managing all of these data and sharing it with trusted colleagues in a controlled way. And this is fundamentally the gap that the scratch pads were intended to fill. The scratch pads are structured websites for managing biodiversity data within a particular research community. They act as a kind of virtual research environment for their users, allowing multiple researchers within a community to build data sets and access tools necessary to work with these data. As a condition of use, data within the sites is open, uh, open access once it's been publicly made available. The software is also completely open source, so others can build and share upon the source code. And this is done in a modular and very flexible way, so scratch pads can serve the needs of very, very different research communities um, through this single digital tool. The project has been running since 2007 and has the goal of trying to make taxonomy more digital, more open, and more linked. And in this regard, the project has really been very successful. There are uh, almost 550 different research communities now using scratch pads, and most of these provide a space where taxonomic specialists working on particular groups come, particular taxa, come together. However, there's also plenty of sites focused on specific research projects or biogeographic regions. And in some cases, societies are using these tools just to help manage the business of the society. Across all of these sites, there are over 6,500 active users, and the project generates a lot of web traffic. Last year, the content within the Scratch Pass collectively was accessed more than 1.3 million by 1.3 million different visitors, and many researchers are now citing data in their Scratch Pads through conventional publications. So they're linking back to these digital tools. In fact, there were 81 citations to Scratch Pad data that we could count in academic journals last year. A key part of making the Scratch Pad project a success is incentivizing people to engage in new, more digital ways of working. This is because most people are wedded to traditional ways of getting credit, and that usually involves writing papers. So in an effort to address this and encourage people to use these digital tools, so we want people to get credit for their work through the efforts that they're making within scratch pads and through the efforts of building those biodiversity data sets. And so to achieve this, we worked with a commercial publisher, a company called Pensoft, to launch a new journal specifically focused on biodiversity data. 
But this isn't just another regular journal. The Biodiversity Data Journal is a whole publishing platform that supports the entire life cycle of writing a manuscript, from writing, submission, reviewing, editing, and publishing, all in one place. And what's more, the journal is focused on describing data sets. So these can be things like single species descriptions, checklists, inventories, keys. In fact, there are a number of different flexible templates that can be used to write manuscripts that describe their data, describe your data. And they're geared towards helping authors describe, organize, and share their data that facilitates reuse, but also allows them to do it very quickly and very quick, conveniently in the form of this citable publication. And because the whole process is online, the costs are kept extremely low. So for the first phase of this particular project, article submission is free. The new journal launched in September of uh, this year, and we've already published 24 articles. Now, the underlying workings of the Biodiversity Data Journal are actually quite complex, and I won't go into the details here, but this is a sort of a very high-level schematic that shows the basic principles from the perspective of someone using the scratch pads. The scratch pads contain structured and organized data, and the software module that we've written within the scratch pads allows a user to select which data are relevant to the publication, describe these data, and annotate them sufficiently in the form of a paper, and then this is then pushed to the publisher, to the Biodiversity Data Journal, who facilitates the peer review and editing process. And as long as the paper is accepted, um, uh, the data within that paper, which is highly structured, is pushed to one of a number of different data repositories which hold that data for long-term archival and reuse. And as I say, furthermore, the, the paper is then a citable object which the author can get credit for. And the big advantage with all of this is that the process is very quick and easy to do for the authors, the reviewers, and the publishers. So we're really trying to speed up the bottlenecks associated with taxonomic and biodiversity data publishing. So the last of the uh, projects that I want to talk about is also related to um, uh, the scratch pads. Sharing data is a key focus of this last tool. This is the eMonocot project, which aims to build a global electronic resource for monocot plants. And the primary work from this project is a collaboration with Kew Gardens and Oxford University, plus my team at the Natural History Museum all in the UK. And our goal is to make data on monocot plants from multiple communities open and accessible and therefore usable to other scientists. So as I say, this project again uses the scratch pads to link communities together. eMonocot integrates the work of about 60 monocot taxonomists working across 18 different monocot scratch pads. And these communities are mainly working on major monocot families or genera, and they're building identification keys, checklists, and other taxonomic resources, all quite independently within their separate groups. But what we've done through the eMonocot project is bring these data together into an integrated portal, so all this information can be accessed from a single place. Critically, but bringing these data together, we've added tools in the portal that work across this information generate, being generated by these different communities. So the portal acts as a source for uh, data for analysis that frankly would be impossible if these data resided separately within those different groups. So each of these tools that I've just spoken about illustrate just how far the taxonomic community have come in terms of becoming more integrated and outward facing. They enable, these tools enable groups of people to self-assemble around research topics of common interest and produce digital projects that facilitate the reuse of the data that's being generated within those research communities. Nevertheless, there are still many challenges faced by our community that I think digital technologies can help us with. And in this penultimate section of the talk, I want to highlight just three of what I consider to be the big challenges within our discipline. And these really are just three examples. There are many um, areas that I think remain big, but these are probably, I guess in my view, the three biggest. So first off, I want to talk about um, openness. 
Sharing is the absolute foundation for act our activities. Without building a process of sharing into our daily work and rewarding the act of sharing, the biodiversity community can never fully benefit from each other's work. In some communities, especially the molecular research community, sharing has almost always been the default. In the early days of molecular systematics, it was so expensive and time-consuming to generate molecular data that to do anything other than share that data would involve enormous amounts of duplicated effort. But for many other communities, sharing really isn't the norm. And so we need to encourage more sharing. And funders and governments are increasingly mandating openness as part of our scientific activities. Open access publication is probably the most prominent way in which we can share. A recent study looking at the proportion of papers that are now published as open access suggested that open access had reached a tipping point with more than 50% of all research papers becoming freely available within two years. But open access is just one component of being open. There are, of course, many kinds of openness. Within the biodiversity research community, we frequently talk about things like um, open data, referring to the availability of structured data for research, as well as open science, which is trying to free up the process of doing science. And of course, from my perspective, another phrase that's often used is open source, referring to the software code in which we write many of these digital tools. So we need to work more effectively to be more open in everything that we do, and we need our digital tools to incentivize openness through our activities. The second of these big challenges that I want to talk about relates to the enormous repository of data that we've already built up within our biodiversity collections and in the scientific literature that already exists. How can we quickly and cost-effectively mobilize these data and organize it on a scale that can provide a better understanding of biodiversity? We have an estimated one and a half to three billion specimens in our biological collections. My own institution alone, the Natural History Museum in London, has a staggering 70 to 90 million specimens. Now to date, efforts to mobilize data from these collections have been, well at best, fragmented and they involve quite a wide range of different processes. So we need much greater ambition by our institutions if we're to realize the value of these data. We also need to uh, spend a lot more time coordinating effort, particularly within the European Union, towards mobilizing data that's locked up within these collections. In some ways, the path to digitizing and mobilizing collections data has been highlighted by what's already happened within the biodiversity literature community. There are an estimated 300 million pages of literature published on taxonomy and systematics, and uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library project that perhaps some of you are familiar with has already digitized about one-seventh of all this literature over the past seven years. The Biodiversity Heritage Library project needs more help to sustain its activities and address some of its shortcomings. Um, of course, one of the big challenges here relates to um, copyright and the limitations on what we can reasonably share because of um, restrictions via copyright. But we have a number of big challenges associated with how we automate this process of mobilizing data, how we build more storage and more persistence of the data into our activities so that we have this enormous repository of information accessible more digitally and more um, in, a, in a form that we can more readily reuse. So the third and final challenge that I want to mention today is uh, about data modeling. And this is about reasoning across very large linked biodiversity data sets, perhaps with the ultimate uh, vision of being able to um, model and understand the biosphere. And this vision was put forward in a recent nature commentary and in some ways I think represents a clear direction of travel for the whole of the biodiversity research community. In this paper, the screen the shot of which is shown um, on this slide, in this paper Drew Purvis suggests that it would ultimately be possible 
to integrate all data on the biosphere into a single data model that could do things like identify biodiversity trends, explain patterns, make predictions, provide real-time alerts when new data became available that contradicts existing knowledge about biodiversity. In effect, this might be the ultimate policy tool for our community. However, to date, the idea is essentially largely conceptual. It's technically extremely difficult to achieve this, and at this stage we need more effective prototyping and platforms to demonstrate some of the principles that underline these ideas. Within some of the EU-funded projects that I've been involved in, we've made a few very tentative steps in this direction, but I think there's a great deal more work to do in this area. Nevertheless, I think ultimately, linking up our data and putting these, into, these data into a single conceptual model is a very compelling direction for all of our research. So those were just three sort of highlight challenges out of actually what are, are many that I think our research community needs. How do we start to address these big challenges? Well, recently there's been a real effort to integrate the activities of various uh, research projects um, associated with biodiversity informatics into a more coherent and integrated strategy. And two documents that I particularly want to draw your attention to are a recent paper that was published early this year in BMC Ecology, a paper titled A Decadal View of Biodiversity Informatics. And also I want to draw your attention to a recent report published by the Global Biodiversity, published actually by GBIF, but titled The Global Biodiversity Information Outlook. Now both of these documents provide more detail on these and a whole set of related challenges that we face within the biodiversity community. But crucially, they also outline the technical advances that we need to make in order to integrate the activities more effectively across the biodiversity science community. Critically, these areas also represent opportunities within the European Union under the New Horizon 2020 funding program. That funding program, the draft details of which are now just becoming available, highlights the need for bigger, more integrative projects that pull together the work of different research communities to deliver sustainable long-term services associated with all our research data. And it's my sincere hope that these funding opportunities will help bring the work of the taxonomic community together and link that work with other research communities where that data is needed. And on that very positive note, I hope, I think I'll finish there. Uh, I wish you all the very best for your conference, and once again, my most sincere apologies for not being physically with you and to be able to deliver the full version of this presentation. But anyway, thanks very much for your time.